Interledger Community Call, 29th of November. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. I uh, see we're almost up to 20 people on the call today. Uh, great turnout. Um, the main focus of today's call is that Evan is going to talk us through some experiments he's been working on the last few weeks, uh, some ideas for a, a new version of, of ILP. Um, uh, before we get into that, I just wanted to very quickly recap on the events we've had recently. So for those who are able to attend, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we, Stefan, Ben and myself presented uh, Interledger at an event in San Francisco, another in Singapore, and then a third in Tokyo. Um, they all went really well. Uh, I think attendance got better each week. So we, I think we had about 40 or so people in San Francisco, a combination of a big benefit concert on the same night and, and a, probably a poorly selected venue, which I'll take a blame for. Um, but numbers were up probably around 60 or 70 in Singapore. Great venue. Thanks very much to the, the team that helped us put that together. Um, really interesting week for me as well, Singapore FinTech Festival. Um, and, and met some really interesting people there, as well as IETF, uh, where um, we had some presentations on ideas around HTTP, header-based payments, and so on. Um, but the the best attended event by far was in Tokyo, so thanks to anyone on the call who was at that event. We had to pull in extra chairs just to fit the over 100 people into the room that we had. Um, and, and I believe in the back of that event, we've got a small user group in Tokyo who are forming and want to meet regularly to continue working on Interledger projects. Um, I think a big highlight for me of that event was that we actually had some external guys who approached us and said they wanted to present. Um, and they presented a pretty awesome project they're working on for KDDI in Japan, a big mobile operator, where they were doing interoperability between a um, phone resale and a phone uh, repair system, uh, where there were tokens representing, you know, a resale, uh, um, uh, secondhand phones and tokens representing kind of repair vouchers, and they used ILP to transfer tokens between the systems, uh, one of which was running on Hyperledger Fabric and the other which was running on um, Quorum, the, the sort of enterprise Ethereum. So really cool to see um, to see that and, and they put that all together just on the back of um, what they were able to you know find online and from the tools we've put together over the last few years. So I, I think it was really successful three events. Um, Tokyo definitely a highlight for me. Uh, and, and thanks to Ben and Stefan as well. I think um, Ben's laser beer demo went down really well, um, uh, you know, demonstrating some of the retail payments applicability of Interledger and uh, a lot of interesting stuff to work on on the back of those events. So thanks again to anyone who was there. I will share the, um, the slide deck from Tokyo, which is pretty much the same as the first two events, but you know, we, we made tweaks and improvements as we went along. So that's probably the best one to share. I'll, I'll share it over the mailing list later today. Um, and if anyone has comments or questions or is interested in hosting um, an Interledger event in the future, uh, yeah, uh, please let us know, get, get hold of um, the rest of the community via the list or on Gitter uh, if there's groups of interested people in a particular city. Um, I know myself, Stefan, Evan, Ben, um, guys from Ripple, and, and I uh, would be interested in in traveling to meet a, uh, an ILP community uh, if one is forming. And and we had the guys from Everest all the way over in Tokyo as well. So, uh, you know, the, the growing and strengthening community, really cool to see. Anyone on the call who was at the event had any comments or uh, any of the other presenters? I think I see Stefan and, and Ben on here um, have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think that the main takeaway for me was we have to think about how we can actually reach um, more of a developer audience because I think um, very often the, the people that come are you know interested people who are either um, investors in, in different digital assets or um, they're sort of following the blockchain space from the enterprise side 
Um, whereas like, I think a lot of the early use cases are more, um, you know, developers playing around with paid APIs and things of that nature. And most of our demos were that. Um, and so I definitely want to, want us to think about like, can we get into some existing meetups, um, to attract some new people, uh, in addition to sort of the workshops, which are more for the community that's already interested in, in ILP. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think if, um, you know, anyone else on the call is already attending regular dev meetups, um, part of dev communities that, that you really enjoy, uh, let's take the Interledger demos or Interledger, um, into those communities and see if we can find people interested in, in leveraging what we're building. Okay. With that, I'm going to hand over to Evan um, to tell us about what he's been busy with. All right. One, give me just one second to share my screen. Do, do, do. All right. So I have been. So basically, what I'm going to be talking about is some experiments that I've been working on for the past couple of weeks. And so I'm going to talk through some of the assumptions that went into it, the hypotheses, and then um, what the lessons were. So let me... All right, can you all see my screen? Somebody please say yes. 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 Great. <laughs> okay. So this is lessons from the ILP2 slash three experiments. One note on naming. This was just, this is not necessarily successive versions of ILP. This was just what I called two experiments as I was working on it. So don't think necessarily think of these as different versions. Think of these as experiments that we will decide to roles some but maybe not all of the conclusions into our stack and there's so i'm going to go through what the lessons were and then talk about open questions at the end so the starting point kind of two two main starting points one is this general question of what is the right architecture for interledger and then the other one is how do we build a real money open interledger as soon as possible so one of the starting kind of thoughts was that we interledger can integrate with a with basically any different type of ledger using a variety of what we call hash time lock agreements and there's a spectrum of these that provide different benefits to the users of them and this can range from every transfer goes directly over the ledger as we call it the escrow method to trust lines or payment channels now in the recent past, we've been doing a lot with escrow, and there's some, some nice features to it. The downside is that it's very slow, or relatively slow. The, some of the, one of the faster ledgers, the XRP ledger, still takes a couple of seconds. And so, as Stefan was mentioning, they've put together a lot of cool demos for developer use cases where you want the payments to be very fast. And so, one of the starting points for me was thinking, we basically just have to make this fast in order to show off any of the kind of use cases that we're excited about we just absolutely need speed and so that means limiting which type of hash time lock agreements we're talking about to only the fastest ones and so when we're if we're thinking about integrating public blockchains today things that were not really built for speed that really limits us to payment channels and trust lines now Simple payment channels are basically the, for those, I'll explain briefly for those who are not familiar with this idea, but it's basically like, instead of sending every payment over a slow or potentially expensive ledger, you effectively create a shared temporary account between the sender and the receiver of a payment. And each time you wanna send a payment, you just sign a statement that says, you're entitled to a greater share of the money in this account. And so the each successive payment doesn't have to hit the, the ledger itself. It just you just sign a statement and send that to the other party, and they can treat that as 
as fun as good funds so one of the nice things about simple payment channels and when i say simple i mean unconditional payment channels if you're familiar with bitcoin this means check lock time verify style payment channels as opposed to the more complex ones used by lightning this is the same style that's supported by the xrp ledger and ethereum could very easily support this as well so they are supported by all major cryptocurrencies and the key point i think is that they have a nice balance between complexity and risk so with simple payment channels when you're sending it one person is taking the risk for each payment but they can basically limit how much that is and so i wouldn't want to do that if each payment is ten thousand dollars but i might be fine do it doing that if each payment is one cent for example another thing that's nice about this as compared with trust lines is that connectors don't custody funds so if that's an issue then they are getting paid after they're they're paying out so if you're if you're thinking in this model one of the key things that connectors will need to do is limit the payment size and amount of money in flight that's something we've kind of implemented before but haven't put a whole lot of thought into and there's reasons to think that especially for the initial kind of network this would be a very very good way for connectors to manage their risk just because if all the payments are very very small then if any one of them gets lost for example it's kind of whatever you know it's we're talking about cents potentially instead of lots of money things like that so there's there's reasons to think that connectors would want to limit the payment sizes what that means is that every path on the interledger will have a kind of maximum payment size which is analogous to the internet's maximum transmission unit on the internet that's how big a packet you can send with interledger there's an interesting parallel between liquidity and bandwidth effectively and so the idea here is that no matter what there will be some maximum payment size there is an open question of how large that will be and that makes it makes a bit of difference how big you think that will be but the the idea that i was pursuing with this experiment was that we should build for many many small payments and there's some nice things that happen when you when you shift from thinking about we've previously thought interledger would be used for sending anything from small payments to very very large payments and when you need when you're building for these kind of very different use cases you need a, a bit more complexity in order to handle those different use cases well the idea here was to think okay if we said let's just build for small payments and nothing but what would be different and this was kind of what prompted this experiment was a comment by Stefan a couple of weeks ago that streaming payments change everything and he said that as a kind of offhand comment and originally I thought the idea that he was proposing sounded like a terrible one but in the process of debating with him convinced myself that it was a good idea so basically what that turns into is if you think that there's going to be a low maximum payment size and all of the payments will be very very small what you need is something like chunked payments we used to call this streaming payments but we started calling it chunk to differentiate from so just to define these two streaming payments is when you're paying for a service that's ongoing or streaming so you could think of paying for a movie one megabyte at a time chunked payments are when you want to send a larger amount of money but you chunk it up into small amounts either because there it's more competitive to send it in smaller amounts and you get a better rate or because you're trying to get around a low maximum payment size so what's interesting about this is that chunked payments are kind of similar to t what tcp does on the internet where if you want to send a big file over the internet you don't send it all at once you send it in little chunks and as I was exploring this, one of the things that I found is that it actually seems so similar to TCP that right now I have a hunch that we may actually be able to directly use 
one of the most popular TCP congestion control algorithms, which just on a personal note is really crazy. We talk a lot about parallels with the internet, and if we could just copy one of these algorithms and just use it, that would be really, really great. So basically what TCP Cubic does is it's trying to figure out how big a, pa a packet you can send over the internet, and that's a pretty similar problem to figuring out how, uh, how large a payment you can send over Interledger with chunked payments. So that's still underway, but that's kind of a cool thing that may come out of this. Um, some of the other conclusions that have, or thoughts that have come out of, of this experiment are that with chunked payments, you don't know the exact destination amount to put in the ILP packet. So right now, one of the fields in the ILP packet is the destination amount. And the whole network is kind of set up to try to deliver exactly that amount. Now, if you're sending a lot of payments, you don't care as much about how much, like, I don't care if exactly 10 units get there for this payment. I kind of want just as many as possible to get there because I'm just going to send more. So if a couple more, when we were originally designing Interledger, we were thinking that overpayment would be a bad thing. Like if you request a payment for $10, you don't want $11 to show up. But if I'm splitting my big payment into many, many small ones, I just want as much as possible to get there. So you also, it's also a little bit more difficult to know the exact destina destination amount. One of the reasons is that doing an upfront quote doesn't help as much because if you get a quote, that's kind of a static piece of information. This is how much the rate is right now. But if you're sending many, many little payment chunks, it's possible that the rate fluctuates slightly while you're doing it. And so you need a kind of more dynamic way of figuring out what the rate is over time. So one of the proposals that, we, that has somewhat been discussed, but I'll talk about a little bit now, is to replace in the interledger quoting protocol with end-to-end -end quoting. So basically the way end-to-end -end quoting would work is that the sender include, the sender sets some source amount that they want to send, and they, they send a normal payment to the receiver. And then the receiver can either reject this or accept it, but either way they include a message going backwards to say, this is how much I got. And so from that, the, the sender can figure out what the, what the exchange rate is between their source units and the destination units. And what's really great about this is it doesn't require a separate protocol from all of, all of the participants. ILQP is really core to Interledger right now, but if you use end-to-end -end quoting, you just have payments, which is very cool. And you can also kind of think of this as when you want to figure out what the latency is on the internet, you send a ping, which is just a normal internet packet. There isn't a separate separate core protocol for that. You just send the packet and then you get a response back. Another thing that falls out of this is if we don't need, if we're not going to use the amount in the interledger pack, the destination amount in the interledger packet, then there's a question of whether we need it there at all and whether we want this behavior where everyone tries to deliver an exact amount. This is one way that we could go. Another way would be to make a zero amount indicate forwarding only. So that would effectively say to all the connectors, instead of trying to deliver this exact amount, just apply your local rate and forward it. Speaking of that, if connectors only forward amounts, they, it, the behavior that they're doing is super, super simple because they get an incoming transfer, they apply their local exchange rate, and they send it out. They don't need to know about all of the exchange rates of the entire rest of the network, which is what they have to do today. A further thing that comes out of this, in this vein of Stefan's comment that streaming or chunked payments change everything, is that with only two fields in the ILP packet and without ILQP, having a standard encoding for packets seems less important. If, you have, if there's a lot of different protocols, then it makes sense to have consistency between the two. But if the only protocol on the interledger layer is just interledger and it has so few fields in the packet, then it's kind of less important. And what you can do 
potentially is just plop the fields directly into the ledger layer transfer object. This is something that Adrian was pushing for a while back. And I think the, the way I'm looking at it now is that when you have the more, kind of more protocols or more fields, it does make sense to kind of have a specific packet format for them. If it's so minimal, where there's just, there's basically two fields in the interledger packet, then it's fine to just put those directly into the transfer object, especially because the data is the only part that's really end-to-end -end and opaque to all the connectors. The connectors do need to parse and understand the destination address. One of the things that I, to be honest, was both excited and embarrassed when I had this idea, but basically if you look at Interledger this way, it could, Interledger is really just a couple of structured fields and then some arbitrary data attached. And it's a request response protocol. And if you look at it that way, then HTTP actually makes a lot of sense as the kind of messaging protocol for trans for the ledger layer, because it's a request response protocol that has some structured fields and then a bunch of arbitrary data attached. And so you, you could make ILP as simple as a couple of HTTP headers on top of what an otherwise completely normal HTTP request. And there's some arguments to be made for still using like a binary packet and WebSockets, which we can talk about more. But one thing that, that comes out of this is just, it may not be strictly necessary. And so if we did this, it could make, for example, making new implementations of ILP in different programming languages super easy, which would be very cool. Another thing that, that comes out of this is if you think of transfers as being super, super fast, then you don't really, we, we've previously thought of the fulfillment as a kind of asynchronous event that you get back. But if you think of it as just very, very fast, then you don't really care if the next party accepted your transfer. You really only care about what was the result. Did it go through? Did it not? And so this was an idea that Michiel had proposed a while back of making the fulfillment just a response instead of a separate request. And so what ILP could look like is just, you make a simple HTTP request, that's your transfer, and the response has the fulfillment and some data or an error, that's it. Another idea that this adopted from Mihil was this very cool point that especially if you're doing very low value transfers, basically prepared transfers don't need to be persisted. So when you get a, a prepared transfer and you you would put the money on hold, you can basically just do that in memory because the idea is that if your server crashes and you go offline, if these ha things are happening very, very fast, it's super unlikely that you would bring your server back online with enough time to actually go and fulfill the payment. And so there's no real point in storing prepared transfers in the database. So what's very cool about that is then the end-to-end -end payment speed basically just becomes the network latency plus a little, some minimal in-memory processing, which is really awesome. So final thought on this, we've said for a long time that Interledger will be done when there's nothing left to take out. And personally, I'm kind of excited about this direction because it's feeling like we're closer and closer to the point where there's really nothing left to take out. Like if we get, if we do deprecate ILQP, then there's only one protocol on the interledger layer and it's super simple. And I think all of the fields in it are defensible. So that seems pretty close. Now, these are the open questions. I'll go through each of these and then take questions or comments. So some of the open questions include, how large do we expect the average maximum payment size to be? Should we, you know, will it be smaller than most payments people are sending? Will it be larger? Will it be dynamically adjusted as you get more, more trusted by your connector? Question number two, should we deprecate the ILP packet with amounts or should we just use a zero amount or something like that? How do we get these forward only 
payments. Question number three, should we deprecate ILQP in favor of end-to-end -end quoting? Number four, do we need a standard packet encoding? Is that useful? Five, should we recommend using this kind of HTTP-based ledger protocol, or should we stick with the WebSockets and BTP-based ledger protocol? Number six, can connectors automatically route based on peer rates? This was something I was discussing a lot with Mikhail yesterday. And there's an open question about whether we can actually, whether we can have an automatic routing algorithm that will switch the, which way packets are being routed just based on the exchange rate. We can talk more about that if people are interested. And then the last one is kind of more a software architecture question than a, than a protocol one, but in the Interledger JS stack, we use this plugin architecture. And when I was re, when I was trying to rethink this from the ground up, I started with a kind of different approach of a more middleware function based architecture where you'd have different middleware functions that are responsible for different things, ranging from parsing incoming transfer requests to limiting your balance or storing your balance in the database, things like that and that you'd sort of compose a sender, connector, or receiver from a series of these functions. Instead of having just a plugin that takes, that takes care of all of the ledger-related functionality. We can talk more about that if people are interested. So those are the open questions. Curious to hear what people think. Okay, um, no one's jumping up with questions immediately. Uh, I guess the easiest way to do that, maybe um, put your uh, put your question, like if you have a question, maybe just shout it out. And if there's, uh, if there's a lot of people talking over each other, I'll, I'll try my best to, to moderate. Otherwise, um, just put your name in the chat uh, and, and let us know you have a question. Um, with that, any any questions? Um, I'll throw one out. Uh, this is Bob. Hey, Bob. Um, so uh, it looks like if Alice is sending a payment to Bob, sorry for reusing the same metaphor, um, and we don't have quoting and we're just forwarding these things around, the whole protocol is based upon Bob telling Alice how much money he actually received. Uh -huh. um, and then Alice adjusting what she's sending based on the information Bob gives her. Uh -huh. now, those, shouldn't they be considered adversarial parties there? I mean, why should good, we trust Bob to give the correct data? Really, really good question. So one of the things that kind of realized through this is that the sender, unless you're doing an atomic exchange for goods, you have to trust the receiver because they could basically in the old model they could just run a connector between the last quote unquote real ledger and themselves and that connector would just you know apply whatever exchange rate they want and so as a sender in a really open interledger you basically always have to judge prices in terms of your own source units and you you have to ignore whatever the units are that the destination gives you and you kind of just have to trust like if they say this is how much got there and they're expecting a certain amount more to get there then i just have to keep sending until they get it does that make sense i mean it sounds like a hand wavy rationalization but i understand what you're saying there but it you know at the, in the first the original case i would ask a quote and i would know how much it's going to cost and i act or don't act based on what I want to do this. Here you're asking me to act um, and you know guess and react as we go here. It so seems you, like you can, we're creating more failure points. You can get a quote beforehand just by sending, a, you can use a unfulfillable payment as an in, in from purely informational quote. So if you send a payment to the receiver and it, it has a condition that they can't fulfill, and you could set up a protocol, and this is one of the things I've added to the, the transport protocol built on top of this, 
is just an informational one where you set an unfulfillable condition and then they respond with how much got there. So you can figure out roughly how much it should be. Now, one of the issues with chunked payments, just like with sending things over the internet, is you don't, you you can't know exactly how much it will cost because the because the amount the the rate can change over that time. That is definitely one of the downsides of chunked payments. The way I see it now is that's kind of inevitable because I think it's unlikely that connect that you would be able to get a lot of connectors to put the amount of money on hold that you would necessarily want to send all at once for the dur for the duration of your payment. And so this is kind of a if connectors are going to use limiting the maximum payment size as either a risk mitigation strategy or they're going to limit it just because they don't have that much money, then you just need something like chunk payments in order to work around that. Okay, so I'm, I mean, I understand where you're going with this, and I still am in favor of thinking about this with a two level sort of interface to this. One is Alice and Bob, the sender and receiver, and what that they do and what they expect from behavior of a payment system. And two is, you know, ILP low level details of how the money actually gets around. Uh -huh. And so at the highest level, I mean, you, we say things like a connector won't want to lock up these funds for this amount of time. That doesn't apply to Alice, right? Alice is saying, I need to pay um, $5,000 for this thing I want to buy. And basically, she's got it in her bank account, or she doesn't, but it's there at the beginning of the payment. Bob is waiting for $5,000 to arrive before he does anything else, and he's locked up the goods based on that. So this idea of locking up my value doesn't apply to those end units. If you want to say it applies to the people in the middle, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but what I'm most concerned about is the behavior to Alice when something goes wrong and how much of this, um, how much of this simplification that you've made at the low level you're laying off on either Alice or Bob. And I think, you know, as we lay off as little of that complexity as possible, because in the, and they're really just doing a business deal. Alice wants to send $5,000 and get some number of widgets from Bob, period, end of story. And they're not interested in what happens if, you know, network goes down or liquidity dries up halfway through the process and who pays to return the unsent amounts. That's somebody else's problem. Yeah, so I, the, the way that I would, would look at that is you want the, you want to make the experience as, as good as possible. So you would expose an interface where you just say, I want to send this much and I want this person, or I want this person to get this much. And it, the protocol will just take care of that. Similar to like, I want to send this much data over the internet. And if I'm sending more data, it may take longer. Maybe it gives me an estimate of how long it will take or some, something like that. Um, but that's kind of how I would think about that. Now, the, the, one of the main issues with something like chunked payments is that if the liquidity completely dries up in the middle, then you would need to figure out some way of like, okay, now you need to send the money back, which is admittedly a pretty bad case. That said, I think that's kind of, I would expect that on a, on a real interledger network to be very rare. That's like, I'm trying to watch a movie and in the middle of the movie, my connection to the server that I'm watching completely fails and the internet is, com and it's not even an intermediary point. It's just like, there's a complete network split. Like someone has cut the cable between the US and Europe and I'm no longer able to finish that movie. Like that can happen. It just doesn't happen often. And so, especially if you have things like payment channels where you can, or if you can re rebalance quickly, then you can, then I would expect connectors to be able to keep processing unless some kind of very extreme event happens. So that shouldn't happen with any regularity. But, but the original promise of ILP when we laid out the protocol, which is I'm mm -hmm. Alice, right? So I put my funds on hold with my bank who I already trust. Mm -hmm. And those funds don't leave my account until I get what I want. The mm -hmm. thing that I got what I want, then they leave my account. And then no other, there's no other machinations. And that's really sellable. I, I sold that a million times. People love that. The 
money trickles out of my account and you know maybe it gets there maybe it doesn't and i find out if i get what i want later um the world invented that 20 years ago yeah the, i think right now i see this as as somewhat inevitable unless we are expecting the realm of connectors to be very very limited if i expect from the network or actually i i think it's inevitable no matter what so even if we're talking about large banks i'm not i'm not really convinced that the a big open interledger network would be able to send a payment with a, a very very large payment all in one go especially because then you want if you're sending larger payments you want higher time much higher timeouts if you're using interledger universal mode and so then you're asking everyone in the chain to lock up money for a longer period of time. This may represent a significant amount of money if they're, if they're a smaller player, especially. Or we have a very, very closed system where only large banks with tons of liquidity can actually be connectors. And even so, then if you want to send a bigger amount than they are willing to send, you still need something like this chunked payments. So this, I, I'm almost positing this as less of a propose this is a, a, even a little bit less of a proposal and more like today the way interledger works is you get a quote and if you're trying to send a, a larger payment than the network can support it just says no and it doesn't even tell you how large a payment you can send it just says no and so you have to adjust that down or just we can't help you and so this is meant to get around that in the best way that i think it's possible so what I'm, what I'm, I want to be absolutely clear on this. Um, if I'm Alice and I'm saying I need to send ten million dollars over here, I don't care about orthogonality. I want to send ten thousand or you know ten million dollars, and I want to get what I want from this. What level of machination between my bank account and the receiving bank account happens to transfer that? I don't care. And that's really the way the banking system works right now. There isn't really, if somebody sends $10 million, there isn't $10 million sitting in a bank account in the chunk to make that move. They lay that off to brokers. Brokers pay for it in chunks. They buy it from different except, you know, FX guys. Then they wire it to the destination just in time, which just happens to be about two days. But the sender's funds are locked up for those two days. The receiver doesn't get them for two days. But that, that's not uncommon behavior for the sender and the receiver. What's uncommon behavior for them is to have to do a lot of crazy work in the middle of, you know, what if half my the, payment the gets there and I don't get yeah, any of so my goods. If, if a bank wants to offer that as a service on top of this, that would totally be possible. Right. And that's that's what I'm, I'm most interested in because the most sellable things, remember I came from the Ripple sales background and I know what people want to buy and what's interested to them to move this is keeping it simple for the sender and the receiver and then it can be very complicated in the middle and i don't care i just want to know how they all glue together um, so it looks simple for the sender and the receiver and the middle can be filled with all sorts of special cases and and um and chunked payments yeah so but, that's that's totally doable um Seeing two, okay. two que questions on the chat. Um, one from David. Can you clarify number seven on the slides? What's the middleware approach versus plugin? So the middleware idea was kind of inspired by there's a, a popular HTTP web framework in JavaScript called Koa, where you have a series of functions that apply some transformation or, or take some action based on the incoming request and then pass it on to the next one. And so what's kind of nice, there's some, some downsides to this, but what's kind of nice about it is that you can, it makes it qu the code quite modular and easy to extend because you can just compose these different functions. So in the COA thing, if I want a session handler, then I just use that session handler function that someone else has written and I can just kind of plop that in. One of the things that I've, I, we, we've tried a number of different approaches to achieve code reuse within the Interledger JS stack. And I think what it comes down to is that a lot of 
the different types of functionality we might want, whether it's routing related or balance tracking related. Basically take in a transfer and then either check, you know, accept it, reject it, or apply some transformation on it. And so instead of modeling it as there's this one plugin thing that exposes this one interface and then you, that interfaces with the ledger. If there were basically more different functions that all basically expose the same interface and either run some checks or apply some transformations. And so you can, you can compose these together, you can compose different bits of functionality. And so that's kind of a different way of structuring the code internally. David, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. Cool. Um, all right, Roger's question. Conceiving of this as a yeah. four-corner uh, model. Maybe, maybe I could comment, sort of split this up a bit because it's kind of a comment and a, a question. Um, so so the, the comment first is that sort of there are various other discussions going on in different places about notions of interoperability and, and there's a sort of a general notion that's often used which might be helpful here kind of to Bob's point about separating questions of what's the end user experience versus the, the players who are actually making the network happen. Um, so that, that's essentially the notion of a four corner model A. So Alice and Bob and their respective service providers. So that, that was kind of the comment and then the, the, the question per there and, and sort of the, the original question that we had here about kind of trying to understand sort of with the, the chunked payments, to what extent does a, you were saying that yes, there is a need to kind of trust the endpoint that they're reporting back <clears throat> faithfully how, what amount they're getting. So this is really Bob's service provider in a four corner picture. To what extent is there a, a risk <clears throat> or an exposure to the possibility of them sort of systematically gaming the system and misreporting the amounts sort of shave off small amounts? Is, is, that, is that a risk? Is there a trust issue there? That, that is a risk because you just effectively, un unless you are doing an exchange of goods where you send all the money and they send the goods and the money only moves when the goods arrive. That's the Bob's idea of circular payments. Unless you're doing that, if you just send the money and then hope that the receiver sends the goods, like even if you send the money atomically, they could still not send you the goods. So you send one whole payment and then they just don't send you anything. And they could say, oh, now I want more if you want these goods. Like there, there's always that risk right, but, if you're but, just but, sending but the money is, first. Th this is kind of the point sort of the, the, the reason why I was kind of trying to clarify the sort of the four corner picture here, because it seems to me there are sort of slightly different trust issues that arise with the actual, with Bob, the recipient of the payment and and Bob's service provider. <laughs> I, I think what I heard you be saying there is yes, obviously there's a need that you're going to trust unless there's a kind of, delivery versus payment thing going on mm -hmm. with yeah. Bob as the recipient. I'm really talking more about Bob's service provider here. Okay. Yeah, so so connectors can, and this is something that I was talking about with Michiel about a bit. Um, connectors definitely can, this is basically what happens if connectors change their exchange rates. And so the hope with this is that if there are multi, so if there's only one path through the network, then you have no option. And the connector doesn't need to do anything sneaky in order to charge you a higher rate. They can just charge you a higher rate. If you have multiple options, then you could basically, if you're sending a single chunk payment, you could send multiple chunks through different paths and basically just give more traffic to whichever path gets more money there. And so you could, you could do that in real time and have them basically competing against one another. But really the only thing that prevents connectors from just charging you a higher rate is the availability of other options. In general, what I would hope is that if we make this network work well with smaller connectors, that's the thing that I would see increasing the competitiveness. Right. I, I wonder though as well, is there, is there a kind of a distinction or a useful distinction to be made here between the actual ledger on which Bob, the recipient, has their account and, and the sort of connectors which are potentially the last hop for actually getting that money to them. Um, in the, so not, not really. So it, we, we used to think of ledgers and connectors as very separate and then had this thing that we 
kind of jokingly refer to as the interledger enlightenment, where we realized that most times you would just have a connector and the connector would also ex kind of track balances for you as well as provide connectivity to other things. And so this is sort of the ledger and connector rolled into one. Um, I wanna take the, uh, there's two more questions I see in the chat and then we can, we can come back to this if there's time. So um, is question one, is there a difference between payment and IOU slash credit in this model where trickle movement of funds is used? So kind of no. The way we think about IOUs versus credit versus good funds or, or quote unquote real money in Interledger is that's kind of a bilateral relationship. Whether you, someone is forwarding money based on credit or based on real funds, is more their problem than the entire network. So when the when when the payment is received, that's as good as whatever it means being received. So if you're accepting money on Bitcoin, that means that that's irrevocable no matter what. And so even if somebody is paying on credit, the credit is is just a bilateral relationship. Question number two: Is there any mechanism for knowing how to provision for liquidity for the forwarding agents in between, even if it's local exchange rates? How do we know the rate of flow through a node? Um, when you say rate of flow, do you mean the how much, how much, the kind of amount of yeah, volume of payments while, going through a node? Right, right. While while we probably know there are multiple paths through the uh, through these ecosystems, mm -hmm. uh, and because there is no coating process technically to begin with, you are trying to forward it to the next node whichever is the best node for you, honestly, mm -hmm. right? So if, if that concept is used, how do we, uh, how does any node provision for uh, the liquidity that it needs to maintain? In terms of how much liquidity they need, need to maintain with their peers, like what kind of bandwidth they need? Yeah, with their next immediate, because at the end of the day, uh, they would need to provision for some sort because these are the agents who are technically having the liquidity mm -hmm. uh, outside of the outside of the two endpoints uh, for the network to function. Each of these smaller entities, we are breaking down the problem of bigger marketplace uh, liquidity providers into smaller mm -hmm. and smaller pieces. So in these smaller and smaller pieces, it all depends upon how the transactions are routed through these nodes or through these forwarding agents. So, yeah, so I'm just wondering, is there a concept? More sort of. So if I understand the question correctly, then each connector basically needs to figure out for itself how much liquidity it wants to have with each of its peers. And that will kind of be dependent on A, how much liquidity it has in total, B, what kind of bandwidth it wants to allocate to its different peers. So if there's a lot of traffic coming from or going to one of them, it may want to allocate more of its bandwidth to that, or if one of them is a really good customer. And then in terms of finding out how much bandwidth its peers have, that's a little bit trickier because that's something that you would only really find out from experience, I think, where you would, right. each connector might have a sense of how big a payment the, their peers will support, but it's harder to, to judge how, what the volume of payments that can be sent through each peer. But right. the way that I would think about that is, is also similar to how the, the internet does it, where you think you, you have a couple of different routes and you say, all right, for this destination, this is generally my best route. If they start giving me back errors, then I might switch to a different one. Right, right. I was trying to correlate this with the correspondent banking picture where you have multiple partners and any of these particular routes is technically determined by either the contract or the volumes of the particular period and time mm -hmm. uh, and many other uh, factors of that nature. So is there, a, is there an algorithmic way of finding out how best to route it? That, that's kind this, of that, uh, that question number six on the open questions. I, right. There are di different thoughts on this. Right now, I'm personally leaning towards no, and I think it, it may be impossible to design an algorithm that takes into account things like cost and success rate that can't be gamed. Right. 
Um, it's possible mm -hmm. that some things could be designed, but I don't think there will be one answer for all of the connectors. I think different connectors will set that up differently. And that's definitely going to be an area of research for us, but I don't, I think, at, my guess is that at the start, it may be quite manual with some things like pro test payments used to probe different exchange rates and things like that. Um, but I think any algorithm that we could kind of define and just say, okay, this is how routing works, will just be gamed very quickly. Thank you. Absolutely, good question. Anybody else? Got five more minutes. Evan, um, nope. just a, a thought no. going back to the, the two questions you asked at the very beginning about kind of what is the right architecture for the internet and then the second question, how do we as quickly as possible get to a real money interledger? Um, and kind of obviously the, the technical aspects are the main focus here. Uh, so it seems like most of what we've discussed relates more to question one. Are there any particular aspects that are occurring to you here that relate to the second of those questions? The sort of yeah, good, how, good. how quick this gets to be a real network? Good question. So I think that limiting, having very, very low limits on the payment size will help us get there much quicker because A, there's things like just software bugs. Like if we're just running software in production for the first time, there will likely be bugs. And those could be bugs that cause you to lose money. Now, if you're talking about larger amounts, that's kind of unviable. Like you need to be confident that you're not gonna lose money. But if we're talking about very, very tiny amounts, you know, maybe it's it's kind of whatever. If you if you have enough triggers in place to say, okay, if I start losing more than this amount of money or payments start failing, kind of shut it all off, see what's going wrong, then it, that's one way to get going quicker is just Smaller amounts make certain makes it so that you can you can simplify certain things you can get going quicker. Um, it also makes the network usable even if connectors are very very small. A further thing is that I think it's important for the connect. There's an open question about if you're using these unconditional payment channels whether you would want the connector or the sender to take risk. I think it's better for the connector to take risk and just because they're in a better position to manage it and it's a better experience for the sender if the connector takes risk. And if you're doing that with larger amounts, that's very problematic. But if you're doing that with sort of tiny amounts to start, and one of the things you can do is connectors can dynamically adjust people's bandwidth. So if I'm a connector on the interledger and you open up a new payment channel to me, I'll set your bandwidth very, very low to start. And then maybe as you prove yourself to be a good customer, I'll increase your bandwidth. But I, I can kind of step that up. So that lets you work with just tiny, tiny amounts to start. And that makes a lot of things easier. So that's, that's a big part of it. Okay, great. Um, so one sort of further, more kind of operational aspect, I guess, to, to that is um, we have the sort of ILP or the, the test net of test nets up and running at the moment. Um, <clears throat> what, what are the implications of this? I'm, I'm not even clear what the status is of what you're talking about here, of this sort of turning into actual code that people are running and connecting to the test net of test nets and versioning and com compatibility issues. What, what does that look like for this to actually become the basis of an, an operational network? Yeah, so the so I started out with just starting from scratch and just kind of re-envisioning everything. I think what what's more likely what we'll end up doing is just taking some of the lessons learned from here and then trying to apply as minimal changes as possible to the existing stack. So that could be things like um, first row, like one of, some of the most important changes are pretty simple to do, like having the forwarding behavior where you don't have the amount, you don't have connectors trying to deliver a specific yeah. amount. That would be relatively easy to add as a feature. For example, if we either added a new new packet type or just said the zero amount works like that. Um, and so that that's one of those. Uh, another important feature has already been rolled in. So we're kind of going about it step by step. Uh, I think I'll I think we'll probably try to 
get a basic version of the chunked payments thing just implemented over the normal ILP stack in the next week or so, maybe less, and kind of take it, take it from there. Thanks very much, Evan. Uh, we, we're out of time, um, but it sounds like there's still a lot of questions. Um, I certainly have a lot of comments, but uh, didn't, didn't want to didn't want to hog the call. Um, so maybe you know maybe if there's interest, we can pick this up again in two weeks. Um, let's let's take the conversation to the GitHub issue list and to the mailing list, and uh, maybe we can compile a bunch of questions and comments from that um, to kick off some more conversation next week. Um, but thanks, Evan. Um, uh, I, I think at a high level, this is this is really cool, and and I see it as as you know good progress. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully um, hopefully this leads us to some some rapid prototyping and some new languages, especially, and uh, and as you say, you know, um, making it easier to actually uh, build out a, a working um, network of these. Uh, of these connectors, um, which are significantly simpler in this architecture. I will um, send out the slides from Tokyo's event uh, on the mailing list in the next half hour or so, and we'll all chat again in two weeks. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.